So uh, I was here, not on this exact stage, but in DevFest last year, and I talked about large language models. I'm the manager of the team that's responsible for documenting generative AI at Google Cloud. And last year, I spoke on large language models in the middle of November of 2022. So uh, anybody know what happened at the end of November 2022 in the world of large language models? A little event you may have heard of. So ChatGPT came out. So what I'm gonna do today is talk about where things look, where things were a year ago, summarize some of the major developments over the last year, and then talk about some of the things that are coming up over the next 12 months. So looking at this a year ago, uh, it was really a niche interest. So there are people who were interested in it who had been using GPT-3 or uh, uh, within Google uh, using Lambda, but it really wasn't something that was uh, general purpose. So looking back to where we were a year ago, I began the presentation with this chart, which showed the history of large language models up to that point. And you'll see here, there are actually a, a, a combination of large language models as well as other models that went from text to image or multimodal. And I really struggled at that time. Like, how do I describe this class of models? And luckily for me, the term generative AI came out. And this really encapsulated large language models, text to image models, other kinds of models. You can see from this Google Trends chart the popularity of the term generative AI. So this is something that really became established. After sharing this uh, timeline, I reviewed some experiments I'd done with generative AI, using GPT-3 to generate Git commands from text, using some other models to uh, translate COBOL to JavaScript, so various, various experiments like that. And then at the end of the presentation, I asked if there were any questions. And there were actually a number of questions I didn't have very good answers for. And in particular, these three questions. Now, the interesting thing is over the course of the last year, because of developments in this area, there are better answers to these questions than there were a year ago. So for the first one, how do large language models keep current? Over the last year, there's been the, uh, ex the uh, externalization, the popularization of a couple of ways that large language models, which are trained at a particular time and are expensive and take a long time to train, can be current. One of these approaches is retrieval augmented generation. So this is using, taking, taking a text from a corpus of documents, generating embeddings from that text, and then using those embeddings to direct the large language model to answer questions based on those documents in particular. Another way to keep large language models current is to give them access to external APIs. So here's an example of something where there's actually a better answer than there was a year ago. How to determine whether text was generated by an LLM or by a human was another question that came up last year. And now there are techniques emerging for watermarking. So using a statistical signature in text that's generated by large language models to determine that it's coming from a large language model, there's a caution there. So you may be aware that OpenAI introduced this in the course of 2023 and then retracted it after a few months because it wasn't as reliable as they expected it to be. So there's potential there for identifying text generated by large language models, but it's not rock solid yet. People were aware of uh, GitHub, uh, GitHub Copilot. So it had been out for about a year as of the end of last year. So people were using it as an augmentation, as a tool to help developers do their jobs, to turn text into code, to interpret code. And somebody asked the question, is this gonna affect other kinds of professions? And the answer is yes. There are two concrete examples. For, for legal work, there are a number of different generative AI-based applications to help with legal work. And then in the area that I work in, in documentation, uh, SWIM produces a generative AI-based application for automating parts of that action as well. So the impact of generative AI has moved beyond just the, the developer world to other kinds of professions as well. So now we recapped where things stood last year. I'm gonna go quickly through what's happened since last November, looking at it in three ways. The timeline, that is what's happened month by month since last year. The overall large language model ecosystem. So when I spoke last year, it really was about models and now it's more about the overall system of how do you mitigate some of the limitations of large language models and how do you efficiently create applications that use large language models. And then finally talk about some of the vendor offerings that are available now. 
So looking at what's happened last year, the big thing, the big bang, November of 2022, ChatGPT comes out. In February, Google puts out BARD, the consumer chat model. And this is important, I'll talk about it a little bit later, the distinction between consumer and enterprise. In March, GPT-4, which is OpenAI's new flagship model, comes out, along with plugins. So I mentioned before the ability to have an LLM call out to an API. So plugins, that's the, that's the framework that OpenAI provides for that. In April, AWS Code Whisper, this had been in preview, was general, made, became generally available in that context. And then in May, Vertex AI, generative AI comes out, one of the products that, that my team works on, providing a model garden, so a set of curated models, both Google models, open source models, and third party models, as well as the ability to use the Google console to interact with the models. And the new Google flagship model came out, Palm 2. In July, Llama 2 came out from Meta. This is important. It's an open source model that is, with a small asterisk, usable in commercial settings. This is, this is a very, very important development. Uh, OpenAI came out with Code Interpreter. I'll talk a little bit more about that later. And Anthropic came out with Claude 2. And Google Cloud, and then Duet AI within Google Cloud came out in preview. So providing a way for developers to turn text into code, to get answers about uh, Google Cloud, and to interpret code as well. So one of the big changes in the last year is the emergence of tools that, and add-ons could be described as the LLM ecosystem. And this table highlights some of the, key, some of the, uh, the biggest things. Vector databases, these, these have been around for a while. So this isn't something that's new. But the idea of vector databases being critical in the creation of uh, LLM-based applications did emerge in the course of 2023. And I mentioned uh, retrieval augmented generation. So vector databases, they are the repository that's used to store the uh, snippets of text and the embeddings and to make comparisons to produce uh, grounded uh, responses from the large language models. Encapsulated coding environments. So I mentioned Code Interpreter, that is now called Advanced Data Analysis. So this is within the context of OpenAI's ChatGPT, a sandbox where you can run Python code, and more interestingly, you can upload data sets, upload a CSV file, and get basic analysis done. So this, in some ways, is automating aspects of the data scientist role, which is really interesting. Um, plugins and extensions, so the ability to call out to uh, third-party APIs. I'll talk a little bit more about that later. And then development frameworks. This is really big, LangChain. So cobbling together all the pieces that make up a large language model-based application, the data sources, the models, the responses, and taking, sort of making up for some of the limitations that large language models have, LangChain is an open source framework that makes it easy to do that kind of, do that kind of thing, to put together an end-to-end LLM-based application. So now we've looked at uh, the last year in terms of major milestones in the ecosystem. This is just a way to look at, the, look at it by vendors. So one of the things that's a little bit confusing, people quite often ask, well, is BARD like ChatGPT, and where does, uh, where, where does Code Whisperer fit into this? So this is just trying to lay out the different, the different aspects. So there's the idea of a productivity suite assistance, so Duet AI for Google Workspace, and Copilot 365 are two examples of that. So if you're doing word processing, working in a, which working in a spreadsheet, getting generative AI help for that. Help for developers, do AI in Google Cloud, GitHub Copilot are examples of that, turning text into code, code into explanations. Consumer chat, so Bard's an example of that. And then uh, AI development environment that includes access to large language models and augmented features for creating AI-based applications. So Vertex AI is an example of that, Azure OpenAI, and ChatGPT Enterprise is, a, is a, a subset of that as well. So to wrap up the recap of last year, I want to share a, a, a baseline that I've been using. So I've been looking at large language models since 2022 when GPT-3 came out. And one of the things I've used as, a, as kind of a, it's a trivial way to test them is to say, can they navigate the London Underground? Can they get from one station to another? Give me instructions on how to get there. And uh, they were never designed to do this, never designed to solve spatial problems. And what I found is looking at GPT-3 
GPT 3.5 when it came out, GPT 4, they got better, but they never really solved the problem. They, they would be able to get between one line and another, but not really complex trips. So last month, Bard came out with the ability to automatically make calls out to Google applications. And the effect of that is the problem solved. So now if I ask the question, how to get from East Acton to Croxley, these are two obscure stations, you have to go through at least three lines to get there, it answers the question directly. Not by going to its own training, by making a call out to maps. But it does that automatically. So it knows this is the kind of question, should go to maps, answers the question correctly. So after three years, the problem is solved. And this shows some of the power of the ability of LLMs to call out to APIs, and also the progress has been made over the last year. Now, I looked at the world of LLMs a year ago, new developments in the last year. I just wanna take a few minutes to give my thoughts on some trends that may be important in 2024. So I think we're gonna see more multimodal models. So text, image, video, together in a single model, working together. There'll be continued focus on grounding. So when I, when I talk to customers, one of the things they're most interested in is saying, I want, I want the power of a large language model, but I want it to answer questions about data behind my firewall, or questions about this specific set of documents. And then I think there'll be more focus on efficiency in LLM ops. So reducing latency, so that is making the models efficient in terms of providing responses, and controlling costs. And part of controlling costs is, is using the right model for the right application. So not every problem needs the flagship model to solve it. So helping customers come up to, to tune their application to use a model that's, that's good enough for the application, but is also cost effective will be important as well. So here's where things looked in February 2023. So we've gone a little bit further than the chart I showed earlier. And I asked the question, will the pace of innovation in 2022 continue in 2023? I think the answer to that is absolutely. So in, if anything, things have sped up. And the question to ask now is, is that pace gonna continue in 2024? And if I get a chance to come back on this stage again next year, I think I'll have a chance to say yes, absolutely. It's an exciting area, there's lots happening. No question about that. So please connect with me, and I think we have time for a question or two. Yes. The question is, when will Google Bard be available in Canada? So, so I just, just for context, Google Bard is available in over 200 countries right now, and Canada is one of the exceptions, so I, I, I don't know the answer to that, but I know both parties are working towards making that possible. Maybe let's take one more, and then. Great, thank you. Oh, okay. Does anyone have one more question, or? Yeah, go yes. ahead. You say your question is, do you think Google will ever deploy code that? So the question is, will any company deploy code generated by generative AI without having human eyes on it first? Um, given, the, given the limitations of the models right now, not right now, but who knows where the situation will be in three or four years. Yeah, everything is very fast, <laughs> so. Yeah, but thank you so much, yeah. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you.